going to try and have as informal a conversation as possible. Um, I believe the aim is for young people to feel like they're able to reach and speak to you and ask questions. Um, and you can also tell us what exactly has been happening in the house um, for the last two years and your plans for the next two years. Um, so I wanted to start off with asking you um, what do you believe the highlights of the last two years have been, the big things you were hoping to achieve and what you have achieved? Okay, well, yeah, um, that's a very loaded question because if you're talking about the House and you're talking about the legislature, you're talking about an institution whose work you don't really see. That's anywhere in the world. They're not tangible things that you can see or feel or whatever. They, they, work, they work of the legislature anywhere in the world. Uh, are, not some, are not things that you see with the naked eye. It's not like the work of a governor where you see bridges and you see infrastructure, you see this. Uh, these are things that are on paper, um, uh, but they are probably the most important things. You create enabling environments for these things, other, other, other things to thrive. In the last two years, uh, when we came in, first of all, the, the, uh, we came in with the determination that uh, we're going to try and blur party lines and work as one and so that we can achieve more. We also came in uh, with a philosophy that we will also try and work with all the arms of government, um, particularly the executive. Um, even though in a constitutional democracy you have checks and balances and separation of powers, but you don't take that to mean that you go to fight. Because there's a saying that when two, when two elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. We're all familiar with that saying. The best way to maximize results and achieve is for cooperation. And that's the philosophy we came with um, to exercise our constitutional responsibility of checks and balances and hold the executive feet to the fire, but at the same time balance it with cooperation that will inert the benefit of the people we represent. Um, and in the last two years, we've done just that. And in doing that, we've achieved results such as, for instance, which you've all heard about. And that's why I say these things are not things you see or you, or you feel. Uh, we'll just talk about env enabling environment. Now, the, the return of the budget cycle from Jan to December, January to December, a lot of people don't understand the implications and the impact that has had in terms of governance, uh, in terms of investments, in terms of um, knowing exactly what, uh, what to expect and how to plan, and that is for investors. Um, hitherto, for years, uh, everything had been, uh, we had missed that uh, constitutional requirement of January to December. We, we cooperated with the executive. We made, made sure they brought the, uh, the budget on time in September. And we were able to work all through to go back to January, December, which allowed people to invest, which allowed government to plan, which allowed um, a lot of things. Um, we're in the process of constitutional amendment. We all know the importance of that. And maybe I should have left that for last. I'm sure we'll get to that at some point during our conversation. Uh, a lot of bills have been passed by the House, a lot, quite a lot. Uh, but people are not necessarily interested in bills. Yeah. And that's why I said the work of the legislature is greatly misunderstood and difficult to understand. Uh, we came out of a COVID, or we're not even out of it yet, but uh, we've been through a period, a COVID period that's been very difficult for Nigeria and for many other countries. But the legislature has been very proactive in dealing with it. We came up with, um, with bills which, even before they made it all the way to becoming law, the executive um, adopted a lot of the provisions in that bill. And that has made it easy for, it made it a lot easier for us. Uh, we worked closely with the executive to contain the virus. Uh, many of us may not appreciate this. Uh, uh, when you compare uh, what happened during that period to other even more advanced democracies, you know that Nigeria did very well. 
do very, very well. And that was because of the proactive nature of, of government. So um, how has being speaker affected your, um, like say, your relationship with your constituents? I mean, back in Sri I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. So um, like you said, you're now responsible for over 359 other members when there are issues in their own constituencies, you have to show up as well. So how has that affected your relationship with your constituents in Sri Lanka? Well, luckily, I have, a, I have an understanding constituency uh, and constituents um, who understand the rigors and the demands of the job. They have been very faithful and very loyal, uh, very faithful, let's put, let's put it that way. Um, they are reaping the benefits of what they, the, seed that, the seeds that they have sowed in terms of the support they have given me over the years. And uh, uh, it is that support and continuous uh, winning of elections that, that has brought me to the point where I became speaker. And that experience has, uh, is working for them. Um, now, it has affected it uh, uh, in two ways. One, I was always in my constituency back then. Perhaps every week, perhaps every two weeks. They saw me all the time, I was on ground. So that's, that's the downside in the sense that I'm not anymore. Because of the demands of the job, I have to be in Abuja uh, a lot. I have to travel a lot. I have 359 members, like I said. Each one of them represents a constituency. And, um, uh, uh, there's always one function, one, uh, something going on. I have to travel to different constituencies. So my constituents don't get to see me the way they used to. But they, like I said, they are understanding. They know exactly. But dividends of democracy, as we call it, uh, whatever that means, um, I believe they're seeing it. I believe they're appreciating it. I believe they're, they're enjoying it. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, you mentioned earlier that most of this work that you guys do in the Congress is uh, something that Nigerians hardly see because most of it is on the paper. So how, how do you plan to connect to the people to, to get to know, to hear, to see what the Congress is doing, the effort you guys are putting? And also, in my opinion, I believe that's going to help the democracy from the grassroots because people will understand the work and they will elect the right people that will go there and do the work. Mm -hmm. So what, what, how do you plan to connect to the people? To yeah, good question. Well, the first question, I, I'm going to throw another question back at you. It depends. It depends on, in the first place, do people actually even want to understand the roles of the legislature? Or is it baked into their mind and their thinking that, no, we don't want to hear, this is what we, as far as we're concerned, oh. this is the role we want to give you, even though this is not your role. Um, there's something called separation of powers. The executive has its role, the, the National the Assembly has its role, state assembly, state government, local government, and there's a reason why it's that way anywhere in the world, because one, one office, if you're a member of the House, or cannot do everything. It's not possible. It's just not possible. Uh, uh, so it's a deliberate attempt for those who framed the Constitution or whatever part of the world to separate those responsibilities, uh, responsibilities just like you would have in your office if you have an organization. Uh, there's something for the PR person to do, there's something for the managing director to do, there's something for the treasurer to do which is separate from everybody else, there's something for the secretary to do. Um, it's a detail, uh, the, 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 the government. How do we intend to to connect with the people and to educate them on these specific rules. Uh, let me give you even an example. There's no election I've done, none whatsoever, um, that I haven't gone around to seek re-election and campaign and go to communities, go to CDAs, go to my people, and they, they point out things that they are dissatisfied with. They look at me and tell me about the gutter uh, you know, on their streets that has not been cleared. They talk to me about uh, the road that belongs to the local government that I, ha I haven't fixed. You know, they talk to me about just different things that really, really uh, have nothing to do, uh, to, to, to do with me. I've had to come from Abuja many years ago to go to a part of Suri, Tejushu, where there's a heap of garbage that have been there for 
for a while, but they looked to me to come and clear it, which I had to do. How have we tried to connect with this to make people understand that, no, this is not the role, this is our role. You need to hold me to my role, hold me to what I'm elected to, to the responsibilities I'm elected to discharge, not the responsibility of the local government chairman or the council or the governor or the... We have broadcasts. They show the National Assembly on Thursdays and there are a couple of other, uh, other programs uh, on air. We have TV, we have radio. We disseminate information as best as we can. Last year, a couple of years ago, we set up uh, the Green Chamber magazine, which is a periodic, I think it was a quarterly magazine, which um, informs about the responsibility and the duties and what we're doing in the National, in the national Assembly. People compare you to other countries, Germany, London, America. But I tell them, when you, you compare, you say you want legislators to be like those guys. But those guys out there, the constituents don't tell them to come and clear their rubbish. The constituents don't tell them to come and clean their gutter. The constituents don't tell them to come and do this and do that. But I can understand. I can understand. Um, you can only hold somebody who you, you see. You can only hold those who you know. You can only hold people who are close to you. Thank you. Um, so I think my question is going to loop back to maybe it's communication. Um, I don't think in the history of Nigeria there's been as harmonious a relationship between the executive and the legislative as there has been since 2019. Um, they get along, you guys get along quite well. But I don't see, you just mentioned that over 800 bills have been um, passed in the House, but I don't see any sort of like huge legislative agenda like maybe this is, the House is going to create a welfare state or we are going to push a certain deliberate legislative agenda. And um, I don't know if it's an issue of communication or if it's that it just doesn't exist. Because for many young people, like you said, maybe we are just not aware of what is going on. So I would like to know what the Ninth Assembly's huge legislative agenda is, if any. Well, yeah. Um Again, it must be a question of communication. And we have tried as best as possible to communicate. We launched the legislative agenda of the House of Representatives um, two years ago, shortly after we came in. We distributed uh, books on the legislature. I have a couple here for you. Uh, it was all over the place. News, the radio, TV, newspapers. It was a big launch. Uh, for this reason, we could have done it quietly and say this is our legislative agenda, known to ourselves and the executive. But we made it a big, show, a big we made a big, big show over it, so that the public, the Nigerian public, the youth, they will understand. It's a ten, about a ten point. We even did a, a relaunch months after, after the, and what necessitated the relaunch was um, the COVID experience, the COVID um, which we didn't see coming. So we had to distill the agenda to meet with the times and to address, more, to give certain things priority. And we do reduce it to about, uh, about a 10-point legislative agenda. Uh, the launch was big. You know, we had the diplomatic corps, we had um, professors, we had the executive, we had everybody. Um, so the question I have to throw back, how come it's not getting out there? Every mode of communication, every platform for communication, whether it's TV, whether it's uh, social media, whether it's print media, was utilized. Um, and we keep talking about it all the time. And those are the bills. And we, we even had something we called a contract with Nigerians. That's what we tagged it. So you can hold us accountable. And as we go along in the next, uh, for year one to year four, um, we, you tick the boxes. Uh, have we done this that we said we were going to do? Have we done that? Have we done that? Have we done that? Um, it was a deliberate effort. Um, um, I guess it will be a continuous, and that's why I said earlier to the first question that are people actually, do they actually want to hear or listen? Or they have they made up their minds that no, we're not interested in that, this is what we're interested in. And if this is what you're interested in, and it's not the, it's not the portfolio or the work of the legislature, you cannot give what you don't have, you cannot do what is not your responsibility. Our responsibility as legislators is to to make laws for good governance, to oversight, to attract federal presence. And I think every member of the House, 
irrespective of what people say, every member of the House has done his best and is doing his best to meet those obligations. Lawmaking, you talked about, I talked about 800 bills. It is, so there has to be responsibility on everybody, the two sides to a coin. It's got to be the responsibility of the people who, the govern, the, 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 those who are governing to communicate. There's also a responsibility on the people out there to dig, to ask questions, to figure out whether these people are doing what they're supposed to, to do. Um, that is what you see in more developed uh, democracies. Uh, um, if I ask, if I tell you today uh, that maybe in a year in the United States, uh, one democracy we all look up to, may end up passing maybe 40, a year or two years, 30, 40 bills to the research. But our democracy is only as strong as our elections. Yeah, Where democracy we, is what? Our democracy is only as strong as our elections. Where are we at the moment with the um, amendments to the Electoral Act and what can Nigerians look forward to in the amended Electoral Act when the legislative process has been concluded? Well, good question. Thanks. Uh, so look, any amendment to any law, the mindset or the, the, the idea is to make, you've found loopholes, you've found uh, things that you can make that law better. Uh, the law is very dynamic. It changes with the times. So any amendment to any kind of law is not to take you back, but to move you forward. And the, the Electoral Act is no exception. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's going to be holistic. We're going to, uh, you will find amendments that will make our elections stronger that would try to reduce manipulation um, uh, and bring more transparency and accountability. That's what you see, one. Two, I can go out on a limb and tell you that we believe, we hope that the that House would have passed the amendment to the uh, Electoral Act by the time we leave for the summer break. When are we leaving for the summer break? Um, I think mid-July. That's probably about four weeks from now or something like okay. that. Yeah. Mustafa. Mr. Speaker, we all know here now the current security situation in Nigeria is concerning. So I'm trying to ask, what, what, I, what is the National Assembly doing working with the executive to put security situation in order and in control? Well, first of all, um, a lot, a lot. Uh, uh, we've been talking about bills and all of that. I'll come back to that. But in terms of motions, uh, uh, um, you almost, it's almost tiring that almost on a daily basis, uh, before we even start the business of the day, uh, it's one motion or the other on security. Members are unrelenting in terms of being forceful and pushful on the issue of security in the country today. We've passed several motions. We've gone to the extent of doing something almost historic where we invited the president to address the national, to address, address the House of Representatives on the security situation. Uh, but unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, some people thought um, it was a dangerous president. And um, the president was very, very determined to come and address the House. Very, very determined. Dates had been fixed and all of that. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we didn't have that opportunity. All hands are on deck. The president is very determined. Uh, it's not about one person, it's about everybody coming together. But when you start to play politics with security, which is sometimes the tendency, then we have a problem. Uh, when a nation, a country, when, when they're faced with a situation such as this, they come together. They come together because there's only one common enemy. But Nigeria seems to be defying that. Nigeria, Nigeria seems to be there are several enemies including government.
Government cannot be your enemy. Now, government might not be doing the best or enough for you, but you don't aggravate the situation. You don't. It's almost a, a no-brainer. Uh, whether you're Muslim or whether you're s Christian, what you're taught is to pray for those in authority, pray for your government, even if you're not satisfied with what they're doing. And if you're not satisfied, maybe at the end of, uh, there's an election, that's what democracy is all about, there's an election cycle. And you vent your anger at the, the ballot box, not what we're seeing today. Um, so yeah, in terms of security at the House of Representatives, a lot has been done, and it's still being done. Um, I have a question on the economy. Um, the Naira has been devalued by over 100%. In the last few years, our local debt has almost quadrupled. Foreign debt has almost tripled. And um, I think many young Nigerians feel like our future has been mortgaged. There's all this debt we have to pay, um, and we can't see the infrastructure or the investment in human capital to say, OK, this is a reason. This is fine. Um, in my opinion, it does seem like the harmonious relationship between Congress and the executive means that maybe in a bid to go back to the January, December budget, it seems like this, these huge budgets have been passed, this request for borrowing have been rubber stamped without any serious rigor. And young Nigerians are left holding the bag to pay for all this debt and pay for all this um, there's all this money that we and our children will have to pay for, but we can't seem to see where the money has gone. There's a budget that says um, things should have been built, and it just doesn't seem like much has been done. And I'm wondering if, again, like you said, maybe it's a communication issue, or is there anything for us to look forward to? Because that's something that a lot of young Nigerians are really wondering about. Because um, we are the ones that are going to have to pay this yeah. money back. Yeah. Um, Jolaka, let me ask you are you, are, you really, are you serious that you don't see the infrastructure on ground? Yeah. You don't. Okay. Well, there's very little I can do about that. But it's there. Just yesterday, I was with Mr. President in Lagos. I was with him in Lagos where he, <laughs> they would commission the, uh, the Lagos Ibado Rail massive edifice in Ebutemeta. I saw it, I rode the train, I... And that's just one out of many. There's nobody uh, who wants to be objective. The infrastructure that this government has put in place, no government in Nigerian history, none whatsoever. And facts don't lie. It's empirical, it's there. The roads, power, Bridges. Uh, um, it's it's acknowledged that uh, this government has uh, built more uh, road network than any government in history. Now, in terms of human capital development, um, you know all the things that the CBN is doing. Uh, the things that are visible to everybody. They're not just on paper. Uh, in terms of diversification of agriculture, which was just a lip service in past regimes. Um, uh, so SME borrowing, uh, agricultural anchor borrower, borrower programs, and so many other things that this government is doing. Uh, they're there. They're there for everybody to see. Um, there's been a lot of squandering in the past. There's infrastructural deficit that will take us 200 years to fill. It's been analyzed. The infrastructural deficit in this country. And you have to fix the infrastructure for your economy to even improve. Infrastructure and economy, they're interwoven. You cannot separate the two. It's impossible. For you to grow your economy, you've got to develop your infrastructure. How do you develop your infrastructure? You don't develop your infrastructure with stones. You develop your infrastructure with money. Everybody, all successive regimes, all regimes of uh, administrations have always looked to the petroleum industry. Now, all of a sudden, and, that's, and, and petroleum is finite. It's not infinite. All of a sudden, there's a squeeze. 
were not. Uh, when this government came, you were talking about fourteen dollars. You couldn't even sell the petrol anymore, so there was no revenue. So how do you get the money to develop the infrastructure which you need to develop anyway? If you're a serious country, you must develop your infrastructure so that you can grow your economy. And the only place to develop your infrastructure, the two look the countries who don't have um, petroleum or any product, they rely on their taxes. Ordinarily, ordinarily, we don't even need any. We don't even need any product. We don't even need oil. There was a time when they were doing the budget a couple of years ago or a year ago, and I said, okay, let's do something, experiment. Let's experiment or something. Let's pretend that we don't have oil. Let's just pretend for a minute that we don't have oil. But we have two hundred and something million people, and out of two hundred and something million people. Let's assume a certain percentage, we have you know, 80, 90, 100 million people that are taxable, that are come within the tax bracket. That's enough. You see, you're blessed with, the, with numbers in this country. That's enough. Some countries rely only on their taxes to develop their infrastructure and grow their economy. So that was an ex experiment I tried to introduce. So anything that comes from oil will just be surplus. Petrol is now at what? It's, it's, it's even just gotten, gotten a little bit better. So if that revenue dries up and we don't have it, you're left with no choice but to borrow. There's no two ways about it. You are left with no choice. No matter how frugal you are as a nation, you're left with no choice but to borrow unless you want to the, the country to be stagnant. Don't develop, don't move forward, don't provide uh, whatever for the young people to grow. Forget the farmers, forget Uncle Bar Uncle Bar and forget SIP. Uh, uh, when you were talking about human capital development, I was wondering, you, you know about the SIPs, you know about all these things. Let's leave everything stagnant and not borrow and just continue to pay salaries. But we cannot do that. So you have no choice but to borrow money. Now, there's nothing wrong with borrowing. All countries do it. Where I agree with you is, are you borrowing for production? And I think we are. When I hear these figures, I, as a, as a, when I hear these figures, uh, the amount of uh, everybody will, first of all, you, you sit back and wait, wait a minute. But then it's the work of the National Assembly to make that the money is borrowed. One, they borrowed on favorable terms, interest rates, moratorium, payback period. And two, that the money is a channel towards what they borrowed for. That's the oversight. So much as it sounds and it's something on everybody's tongue that, oh, we're borrowing, we're borrowing, we're borrowing, we're borrowing. I agree it's like something we should be concerned about, but we have the choice. There is, the country has to develop, and there is no, no, the money we relied upon over the years is not there anymore. You have to face it. Whereas you're criticizing government, you have to look at your past to know what the present is and what the future will be. Okay, so, so um, um, in relation to that last comment about um, widening our revenue net, the Ontario state government has been lobbying for, um, you know, making dealing in medical marijuana acceptable. Um, it's a huge market world over. Is there a possibility that we're going to see that come to life in this current assembly? Then um, I also want to ask, at the last assembly we had about 22 women members. In the current assembly we have about 11. Mm -hmm. That's representation reduced by 50%. Is the House committing to enacting laws that will help us, you know, um, overcome that challenge of underrepresentation? Then. Finally, for me, uh, there are lots of agitations around the country, people talking about going on their own, reverting to regional governments, and I think that's the more sane version of the kind of agitations that we've all been hearing about. I believe in devolution of powers. You talked about um, state police and the fact that it is likely that the House might actually give some impetus to that um, particular um, campaign. What other um, reforms are there regarding devolution of powers that you think this Ninth House might be willing to support? Okay. Um, There's a, a three in one question, right? Yes. Okay, let's start from bottom up. You talked about devolution of powers yes. as a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. um, right now, 
you know, we, most people, I want to believe most people have now come to understand that um, um, the government is top heavy mm -hmm. with about 64 items on the exclusive list. Yes. And the whole idea of devolving powers is a, is a form of restructuring in itself. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about restructure, but nobody has been able to define what restructuring is. As far as I'm concerned, um, um, the end result is, or the outcome is what, what is important. Uh, devolution, devolution of powers, uh, uh, what we, uh, people seek to do is to empower the states more. Yes. And in empowering the states, you empower the local governments and so people can feel the governments. Um, um, like I said, there are about 64, 65 items on the exclusive list. In a real federal system, which is what we call our own structure, it's a federal government. In a real federal system, um, the, uh, the, 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 the federal, federal units are the ones uh, that uh, basically come together yes. and submit some powers to the, mm -hmm. to the center. But in, in this case, it's, it's uh, 64. I've never seen a country where you have 64 items or that many items. There's so many things in the constitution that the, 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 the central government has no business getting involved in. Uh, so it's, it should be a no-brainer. And um, when you when you devolve powers to this to the to the, to the states, you are necessarily um, um, revenue mobilization is revenue is necessarily giving more money to the states because you have reduced the responsibilities of the federal government. So we 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 hope that with this constitutional amendment, um, uh, we can do some significant changes that will reduce the burden of the federal government and send the responsibilities back to the states uh, where they where they belong i'm hoping like i made uh, like i said during my speech that we're not going to just going to be tinkering with the edges of the constitution that are having cosmetic changes cosmetic changes are not going to get us anywhere they have to be far reaching they have to be deep enough to re to define us as a people um, how we want to come together uh, and how the to reshape the constitution in such a way that um, uh, uh, States, states actually uh, are real federated units, are more independent and more autonomous um, to the center. On the issue of gender, yeah. um, on the issue of gender, <laughs> uh, the Ninth Assembly is part of our legislative agenda, mm -hmm. uh, it's part of our 10 point agenda, and um, we've been very proactive about it. Uh, what do you I'm a I'm a he for she ambassador. Is that what you guys call it? Yeah, I'm, I'm part. Of, I'm I'm one of you. I'm fighting your your fight seriously. Okay. But you see, we keep. We, and sometimes when I say this, it's just now that they're beginning. They're beginning to understand that it's the women folk. First of all, they used to hold it against me, but I was only telling the truth. That we had constitutional obstacles. Mm -hmm. In other words, you cannot ask for gender. Uh, you can ask for 30 percent, which is what it was at the time that we were asking for, and not face that constitutional obstacle because the constitution talks about that you should not discriminate based on sex. It doesn't say based on female gender or male gender. It just says there shall be no discrimination based on sex, whether you're female or male. So if you just frontally introduce uh, with 130 percent, you're breaching the constitution. That's what I always said because then you're discriminating against the men. Did you get my point? You're mm -hmm. discriminating against the men. If you're saying women should have 30% of the seats in the National Assembly, the question I used to ask then was that, okay, so what happens to the remaining 70%? Do the women still participate with that 70%? And they say, yes. I said, there, yeah, you've already discriminated um, off the bat for, against women, because at the end of the day, what happens if women now win 30%? of the remaining 70. That means they have 60% and the men have 40. So even though I was in favor of it, we had to do it in a legal way. Okay. Amend the constitution mm -hmm. so that that provision can be tweaked in such a way that we don't run into legal um, problems. And what we've done was to introduce new innovations. I, I tried and I hope it works in the 
considering the amendment we're doing in the provision, provision that talks about federal character, mm -hmm. I've said let us go and redefine what federal character is. Federal character today in the Constitution talks about where you're from, your ethnic, uh, your ethnicity. So everything has to go around all ethnic, uh, all zones. That's what federal character is. Mm -hmm. So I've introduced a provision which I hope it flies that in defining in the Constitution what federal character is, that it be ethnicity and gender. Okay. Because gender is part of our federal character. Uh, there's a percentage of women, there's a percentage of men. So if that can be successfully drafted into the Constitution, uh, um, then the question of representation, uh, it helps the question of representation, gender parity. Two, there's also uh, uh, an introduction, I don't know if that will fly too, and in any country in the world, any democracy, you guys have to lobby for these things. Yeah, in we America, are. Okay. Yeah, you got to. There's a new innovation in the constitutional amendment that says um, that six to six to reserve one seat. If I remember the exact word, it one seat, uh, one in one senatorial district. Or create now you have yeah, three senatorial districts. Create four, and leave that fourth one for, for women. women. Ditto the House of Representatives, the federal constituencies. Now the criticism against that, which you know, obviously, which we're seeking to shrink the size of government, but in, but now you are expanding this the size of government, and how do you fund it? So that's the criticism. So while, while that may be well founded, for me, I think you just have to balance the equities. Say, okay, okay, so there's that problem, right? But then the, this is the advantage, these are the disadvantages. And I think the advantage far outweighs the disadvantage. So the question on medical marijuana expanding our revenue net. Yes. Well, I, I guess it's part of the diversification of the, yes. of the economy. It's a, it's a major uh, debate that has taken the front burner, not just in Nigeria, okay. all, over the, all over the world. Today, there's just uh, there's a mayoral election going, coming up in New York today, starting today. One of the issues is um, legalization of uh, marijuana. So there are pros and there are cons. I, I, I don't know what, uh, it's already in the process in the national, in the house, introduced by uh, Princess Miriam Onoha. Um, and a lot of people are supporting it for business and yes. for uh, economic reasons. Um, but I, I think we need to educate Nigerians so they get a better understanding. Um, are we legalizing and saying everybody can just smoke on the street? Um, I, I don't think that's what it is. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't think that's what it is. I think it's a question of just trying to control it, control its use and make it and so it's not underground anymore. It's just to make it a prescription drug mm -hmm. uh, and license people for medical reasons. Um, I've heard. Uh, Pharmacists argue this back and forth, um, and of course, you know we have a, a, a notable governor uh, from the southwest who's also championing it for good reason. Yes. Um, um, so I'm not sure what the outcome is going to be, uh, okay. but um, the, the, the House of Representatives has, has put it out there. Um, there will be a public hearing. Okay. Uh, I expect people will participate. There's been talk about um, social media regulation, but um, what we've had is basically different um, agencies of government trying to bring in these regulations via regulations themselves or um, operational rules. So what exactly is the position of the Ninth Assembly on social media regularization? Regularization. <laughs> I think what you were talking about was uh, <clears throat> regulation. Of social media, um, um, and I'm glad that it has come to the fore with this uh, Twitter. There's a misnomer. People keep saying ban. I don't know if it's intentional or if it's unintentional. To Twitter suspension. Um, the National Assembly hasn't taken a position. Before you take a position, you have to listen to all sides. You can't take a knee-jerk reaction. It cannot not be a knee-jerk reaction. You have a responsibility. If I was on the outside, I know what position I'll take. Uh, I, can, I can afford that and just say whatever I want. 
But on the, on the, on the inside, I, I've been elected by government, by the, by the people rather. I have to be on the side of the people, but I also have to know exactly what the facts and the true situation is. You know, it's not a beauty contest. Elections are beauty, it's not a beauty contest. You have to be seized of facts on both sides. And that's what I said at my address uh, a couple of days ago on the, floor, on the floor of the house when I referred the matter to the th three or four committees that are uh, relevant, justice, information, and um, um, justice information and the, the National Security Intelligence Committee of the House. What is the government saying? The government saying this poses Twitter, not social media, Twitter, which is one of the platforms, poses a national security threat. They need to find out from government. The committees need to find out from government. Why do you say so? It's not enough to make a blanket statement or a broad statement. What are the facts? What do you know that we don't know? Because we have to also respect the fact that government may be privy to some things that we are not. But the, the government has a responsibility to communicate those things to the people. Before you do anything, communicate, build your case. Build your case. So if the government has a case, they need to build it. What is Twitter doing? Some people have said in the corridors, Twitter supported NSAS, which had the potential of bringing down the government. Twitter left uh, uh, other tweets uh, that are perhaps a thousand times worse than what anybody has ever heard or seen, uh, where people are pointing out people's homes to go and destroy police stations and Twitter left it. So, so there's a disparate, there's a disparate uh, treatment of uh, government and uh, what have you. Government has also said from those who I've spoken to that it's not about the Mr. President's tweet on its own, that's just a culmination, that there's a build up uh, before it got to, that was just the last straw. So it wasn't a nice way later Mr. President's tweet. Mm -hmm. So these are all the things I've heard informally from government. And of course, I've heard from the people out there. And so there's a, there, 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 there's, there's a case uh, to may, be made for and against. How do we compromise? How do we come together uh, so, that, so that people's um, rights, and people talk about uh, freedom of speech, which government has argued that that's not absolute. Yes, there's freedom of speech, but it's not absolute. Uh, so, what, so that that freedom of speech can still be guaranteed, uh, so, or rather can still be protected. This is what I, I want. I want freedom of speech to be protected, but not to the expense of the destruction of the country. So we're looking into that as a, uh, as a house, and we will come up with whatever else. And I believe government and Twitter are already talking. Uh, they're already talking. And, um, uh, and I think the, the, the best outcome um, uh, uh, would be for, uh, uh, for people's rights to be protected, and for the country's corporate existence also uh, to be protected. So it's important that in any, like everything in life, there has to be regulation, it, like everything in life. And we know that social media is perhaps the most potent instrument that can be used for good and can be used for negative. While we welcome the good, we must not we must not paper over the bad or the evil. That's my position about social media regulation. We must strike a balance where people's uh, right to speech is not infringed upon, but your right to speech, where your right to speech ends or begins is where my own right or the next person's right to protection begins. Everybody has a right. So you cannot, because you have the right to speech, destroy me, and nothing comes out of it. So in many more countries, uh, democracies that we'll all look up to are already in the mode of regulating uh, social media. We've all seen US Congress hold hearings and interrogate and squeeze Facebook and all these other uh, platforms. Um, so uh, 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 that's again the, uh, the issue. The National Assembly has been contemplating regulation for a long time. 
And each time they do, people kick. But why do you kick? They say freedom of speech. And I told somebody, I said, until something happens to you, until something happens to you on social media that has no foundation or no basis, you will sing, you will begin to sing a different tune. So um, it's a delicate balance, very, very delicate, but something that we need to do as responsible, um, as responsible. Um, uh, you've heard of cyber bullying and all of that. Uh, children hanging themselves, killing themselves because of what's on social media. We don't want that. We have a responsibility to protect every single citizen of this country, every single one, bar none, bar none. And that's what government is supposed to do. Yeah, um, I just want to. I just want to go back to the concern Joel raised on the infrastructural development in this administration. I think that um, clarified more on my earlier question on the government connecting to the people, because I'm working as an engineer on the same project, and that's the uh, sole reason why I had to relocate to Nigeria. I have seen how much Nigerian government is putting into that project, even though the government doesn't have the money. So I think it is something that the people should know and appreciate to kind of energize the government to do more. Mm. I, I, and, I, and I thank you for that. I'm glad to hear that you are part of the infrastructural development of government. But you, uh, uh, you can tell the story because you're an insider, so to speak. Uh, you came from abroad. You relocated because you you're part of the railway construction that's going on. But not everybody has that privilege to know. Um, so I think, you know, um, Jilla was right. Uh, it's about communication. She was absolutely right, it's about communication. Um, a lot of people don't know what government is doing. Um, but they also need to try and find out. Uh, so we'll need to do more work in trying to be, uh, to, to be conversant what's going on there in their environment and what's, uh, what government is doing. Because without communication, um, every good intention, they say the, the road to heaven is paved with good intentions. Every good intention will just, uh, uh, will, not, uh, will, not, uh, will not achieve what it's supposed to achieve. As for young people who um, worry about the legislature's closeness to the executive or the judiciary, um, when what seems like anti-people decisions are being made, um, what is your response to that sort of criticism? Um, because the role of the legislature, apart from making laws, is also to call into check the executive when they are kind mm -hmm. of going above and beyond mm -hmm. powers given to them. Mm -hmm. um, for the support of every Nigerian, particularly young Nigerians, it's important for them to feel like they're representatives because reps are actually the closest to, especially House of Reps members are the closest to the people, are pro-people, um, are pro what is right, are pro what is just. Um, what is the stance of the Ninth House in not just saying, but proving that they are Pro people, and once again, like I said, maybe it's a communication issue. Mm. Rather, instances in which it has been very clear that the that the House of Reps and the Ninth House has taken a pro people stance. Mm. Um, maybe we haven't really heard of it, but it's important that people kind of understand or know that. Yeah. Okay. There is no other stance that the House of Reps has taken other than pro people. None. And I challenge anybody. Um, um, we're doing a compendium. I think it's best let the facts speak for themselves. The number of motions and the number of bills that um, this House has passed in the last two years, the motions that we've gotten up to speak about, so these are motions that concern the people, uh, whether it's employment, whether it's um, on, on, uh, on agriculture, whether it's on uh, the social intervention programs of government and how it's not reaching the people, whether it's on security, whether it's on corruption. These are motions on a daily basis on the floor of the House. That if I, as a speaker, was not pro-people, or if the people of uh, members of, of my members were not pro-people, they wouldn't they would find their way to the floor of the House. Again, I say 80% of the motions of this House 80. 
um, so again, it comes back to communication. But how else do you want the house to communicate? Uh, I've made statements on the floor of the house. I've read speeches on the floor of the house that are nothing but pro people. Uh, that um, would even make some people in government very uncomfortable with me. But they they know they know better than I'm only doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, as a speaker, our members are only doing what they're supposed to do as um, members um, of, a, of the House. The fact that you're working together, and I'm proud of I'm a member of the APC. And I'm a very proud member of the party. And, it's, I, and, I, and I'm proud to, to pursue my party's uh, programs and policies. And, um, and that's exactly what I'm doing. That's what I will expect anybody that is in my position to do. Now, let's look at the state assemblies where the governors are sitting at the top. I asked some of my members, if you were the speaker of your state assembly, what would you do? Would you go against the policies of your state? Let's look at an advanced democracy. Let's look at the United States, where it was even obvious that uh, for a lot of people, they had a president that, that uh, uh, maybe a different kind of president. They had two impeachment attempts, two impeachment attempts. Not one single party member, Republican party member, well, two or three, obviously. But in both attempts, 98%, 99% of the Republicans voted to acquit their president when it was even obvious to most people in the world that uh, you don't even need to reach that threshold for you to be impeached. Now, that's an advanced democracy. I use that as an example as the way party politics work. But that's not what's happening here. Here, we're balanced. Here, we've gone against government severally when we believe that this is wrong. And evidence of that is the motions and the bills that have been introduced on the floor and debated vigorously on the floor of the House. And those don't lie. So. It's one thing to say one thing, at all. it's another thing to say, to see what's on ground. Um, so we'll continue to, to, to balance the things that come up on the floor of the House. Um, I'm not going to because uh, some people believe that something should, uh, should not be done or should be done and then run and go and do it without knowing uh, 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 knowing the, uh, the circumstances or, or balancing everything. I'm not going to do that. I have a responsibility to the people, and I also um, have a responsibility to make sure that policies of government that are good work. What I can say to the young people is uh, uh, I understand their agitations. I really do, and I think we all do. Um, um, I can only ask that uh, they be more tolerant more patient. Um, room wasn't built in a day. Um, I know things are not the way they're supposed to be. Uh, uh, but I, 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 let's be hopeful. Let's be hopeful. We, we, we that have been elected into, into office, we, we don't know it all. We know the input. Governance is about everybody. It's about everybody. I say it all the time. And, uh, we need more people um, paying attention, contributing constructively, constructively uh, to, to governance. Let me thank you guys, all four of you, for taking time out uh, of your, I'm sure, otherwise busy schedule to, to sit through this boring, the session of asking about government and the role of the legislature. Uh, it's, it's boring. I say that tongue in cheek. It's boring, but it's important. Very, very important. Uh, so I want to thank you, you know, uh, Marisola, Charles, uh, Mustafa, and um, Yola for, for all, for the time. And I hope that it's been fulfilling and rewarding for us as much as it has been for me.